It was a number of years ago. I was in my 20s. I was sitting at lunch with one of those wonderful, radiant, ageless women who just glowed with her love of life. And she was chattering on and on about her kids. Her kids were backpacking across America that summer. And she was telling me all about how she prayed for them, seeing that they could never be outside of God's presence, that they could always feel his guidance, his protection, his love. I was listening, thinking, oh, they're probably about my age, maybe college students. So you can imagine how surprised I was when she paused and she said, I don't know why I call them the kids. They're 67 and 69. <laughs> <laughs> At that moment, I thought it was just a wildly funny comment. Weren't they just a little bit old to be needing their mother's prayers? But then I had children of my own and I began to understand exactly what, you, what she meant. You know, you never stop praying for them. You never stop wanting everything that's good and glorious for them. They never stop growing, and, and neither do you. To me, that's just the tiniest little hint of what students of Christian science mean when they refer to God as father and mother. It's that limitless love that never wears out. It's that absolute benevolence that always wants what's, what's pure and progressive and good in their lives. And you know, that is the love that we all reflect. Whether we find ourselves in parental roles or not, we all have it. Let's give it just a little moment to think about this. If you were to think about the perfect father, what are some of the qualities of thought that you might associate with perfect fatherhood? Gentle. Gentle. Kind. kind. What else? Safe. Safe. Protecting. Protecting. Guiding. Guiding. Patient. Patient. Teaching. Now you're getting on to something I was going to do next, which is let's think of some verbs. What does a perfect father do? Protect. What else? Guide. Listen. Provide. When I think of my dad, I think about laughs, that wonderful sense of humor. Loves. Now switch it around. Give me some qualities of a perfect mother. What? Same. Yes, they're the same. You're one step ahead of me, aren't you? <laughs> so I'm going to go right to that. If you and I were to go down and make a little list, perfect father qualities, perfect mother qualities, perfect father verbs, perfect mother verbs, they wouldn't line up. This is the father side. This is the mother side. They're one. And the parent, or the coach, or the teacher, or the Sunday school teacher, or the grandparent, who best reflects that sense of parenthood would be the one in whom those qualities are, are perfectly balanced, in which all of those qualities are present, and each one acting in, in harmony with the other. You know, it's never a matter of gender. It's always a matter of oneness. And God is one. God is one infinite, indivisible, perfect good. One infinite, indivisible, perfect good. And that oneness of God as we show it and love it and embrace it as our own, informs everything we do, not just our relationships with our children. You know, no one understood this better than Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus understood that God, being infinite principle, brings his qualities together. 
The Bible says, God setteth the solitary in families. If we think about God as infinite principle, infinite pr principle relates its ideas intelligently. And that intelligent relationship of all of God's idea suggests to us what really constitutes a family. That family may or may not coincide with the traditional biological sense of family. It's bringing ideas together in a way that intelligently blesses and unites. Christ Jesus understood this. Once when his disciples were coming together, they, they found that his mother and brothers were waiting outside to see Jesus. And when they went to, to tell Jesus that they were waiting, he asked them a question. He said, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And then pointing to the disciples, he said that his mother and brother and sisters are they who do the will of God. Now, you might be sitting here right now thinking, I'm not so sure why I'm at this lecture. I don't have any children. Or maybe my children have all grown up and gone away. But you might be a brother, a sister, a mother, a father to a child that you haven't even met yet. And why is that? Because you do the will of God. You love. When his disciples came to Jesus and asked that he teach them how to pray, he began to teach them what we call the Lord's Prayer. And how does that prayer start off? Our Father, which art in heaven. In her book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, Mary Baker Eddy renders that line, Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. Now, I want you to really think about that line because that line is going to be the headline for the rest of the talk. Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. It's our Father. That our is all inclusive. It has nothing to do with age, gender, geography, theology. Our Father providing, protecting, understanding. Our Mother cherishing, supporting, nurturing. Our Father, Mother, God, infinite, indivisible, impartial good, all harmonious. Everything fits. Everything's in tune. There are no discordant elements. Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. This line came very sharply into my experience back in the early 80s. I was a member of a newly formed church. And although we had lots of children in the church, we didn't have all that many adults. And so we found ourselves in this sort of enviable position of having more Sunday school students than teachers. So what happened was that our board of directors asked us to make a commitment that we would pray five minutes every single day for the children of the world. And we took that assignment very seriously. And that assignment has changed us in ways that we might never have imagined. One of my friends, Mary Kay, particularly was dedicated to this assignment. And she stayed right with her prayers for the children of the world through some pretty tough times. And her husband had passed on. Her children had grown and left the house, and she had this big sort of ramshackle country house out in a rural county in Georgia. And through her prayers, Mary Kay decided that she would become a foster mother. During the years that she was a foster mother, over 300 children passed through her home. And most of those children attended our Sunday school. Her little van would come up in front of the church, and she'd open the doors, and children would just come spilling out. 
Mary Kay told me that when a child came into her home, the very first thing she did was to teach them the first line of a little prayer that was written by Mary Baker Eddy as a gift to little children. And guess what that prayer is? Father, Mother, God, loving me, guard me when I sleep, guide my little feet up to thee. When the children really knew that prayer, she began to teach them the 91st Psalm. And that Psalm begins, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You see, Mary Kay was teaching these precious children about their real parenthood and their real home. The first little boy who came to her home was a little toddler named Darren. During the year that he stayed with her, Darren was healed of a leg deformity. And after that, he was adopted into a very happy and stable home. At that time, my husband and I had been praying a lot about having children. And it was Darren who inspired us to begin to think a little bit about adopting a child. During the time that we were praying about this, these two wonderful books were just in our hands every day. First, the Bible, and this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which was written by Mary Baker Eddy. In the Bible, we read about Moses' adoption by the Pharaoh's daughter. Did you ever think about Moses as an adopted child? You know, when I would think about that little baby just floating in the reeds by the river's edge, that tiny little guy, I would think, now who would have known that he was going to be the one to lead the children out of bondage in Egypt? Who would have known that this tiny little guy was going to receive the Ten Commandments? Ten rules that would change the world. But God knew. God knew his specific holy purpose. And God put him right where he needed to be to fulfill that purpose. I thought about little Moses so often. And one day I was reading in Science and Health, and I found a sentence that just changed my heart. It says, Spirit, God gathers unformed thoughts into their proper channels and unfolds these thoughts, even as he opens the petals of a holy purpose in order that the purpose may appear. You know, I knew that this child that we were cherishing had his own specific holy purpose and that God was opening the petals. He was opening the petal, setting him right where he needed to be in just the right way at just the right time so that he could fulfill his purpose. And you know, God, divine love, has a holy purpose for every single one of his children. It's unique. It's holy. Each one is needed. And that purpose will appear. It must appear. These, this unfolding of the petals cannot be stopped. Well, as we prayed about our little boy and his specific holy purpose, I thought again about this wonderful idea of God setteth the solitary in families. And I know, and I knew then, I know now more, that every child has his or her perfect family. There are no throwaway children in God's universe. There's no chance. They don't just stumble into a family or a home. Divine principle brings them together. You know, the Bible is full of parents who prayed for their children. Think about the Shunammite woman, Hannah, Sarah, Abraham. These were not helicopter parents hovering over their children's every move. 
they had to so put God first in their own lives that very naturally they committed the lives of their children to the service of God. Very naturally, they knew that the God who created them would care for them. Have you ever thought about what it must have been like to be Mary and Joseph? It must have been such an amazing thing to be entrusted with this very special child. What can we learn from Mary and Joseph about those perfect roles of parenting? Well, first, they had to learn to listen for God's angel messages. And they had to learn to be obedient to those messages, even if it didn't make a whole lot of sense to the common material way of thinking about things. When Mary was told by an angel that she would be the mother of Jesus, she very naturally said, how shall these things be, seeing I know not a man? The answer speaks to the heart of every parent. The angel said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. The Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth and love, comes upon us. And the power of the highest, the Father, Mother, God, so overshadows us that it overshadows our, our doubts, our fears, our personal inadequacies. We begin to see the child as God's creation and not our own. And we become grateful witnesses to the joy, the light, the harmony of what he has created. And we trust him to maintain his own perfect idea. Mary's reply to me is so wonderful. She said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. Can you see the complete surrender of human pride and human opinion in that answer? Could we have that complete surrender? Yes. There's another thing I love about Mary and Joseph. They didn't just wish that their little boy would be more like the other kids. They must have so understood his particular unique mission and, and provided an atmosphere where it could flourish, where it was safe. They must have known that that particular mission could never be derailed. They trusted his purpose, his mission. They had to be willing to learn from their child. Are we willing to learn from ours? Well, I will tell you that my husband and I have learned so much from our children. They have humbled us again and again and again. And by the way, we did end up adopting both of our children from Korea. And after that, another couple in our church adopted two little girls from Korea. And then another couple adopted a little boy and a little girl from India. And after that, another couple adopted a little girl from Russia. And then another family moved into our church and, uh, and brought three little girls from Russia. And now we have little Emma from China in our Sunday school. We like to think that our church has been literally obedient to the biblical command, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. <laughs> But, you know, it's done so much more for us than just filling seats in our Sunday school. That's not what it's really about. It has caused us to cherish the childlike qualities of thought wherever we see them, to cherish meekness and humility and innocence and spontaneity and receptivity. And to, when you cherish these things, you want to protect them, not just in your own children, but in children everywhere. And when you cherish them, you began to discover them within your own consciousness. These qualities have no expiration date. Mary Baker Eddy, who is the author of Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures and the founder of the Christian Science Church, had a deep 
and an abiding love for all children. And she healed many children. I want to tell you about one of my favorite healings of a child that Mrs. Eddy had. And I, I just love this. This took place on July 4th, 1897. On that day, Mrs. Eddy had invited a number of her students and her church members to come to her home in Concord, New Hampshire. And during that day, one of the people who came was a young mother who had a little boy and a little girl aged seven and nine. Now, the little girl had developed a large boil on the top of her head, and she was very uncomfortable. She couldn't even wear the new little hat they had bought for the occasion. So as they came in, the child was not a very happy camper. At the gathering, Mrs. Eddy had a few remarks, and then she stood in the port cashier of her home and was there greeting sort of an informal receiving line. She was greeting the students as they came through. Well, when the little boy and the little girl got to Mrs. Eddy, they just stopped the whole line, and they stood there just beaming up at her. And Mrs. Eddy was beaming right back at them. And finally, after this sweet, gentle moment, she just threw them both a little kiss, and they moved on. Now, this is what the mother wrote about her experience at that moment. She says, I wish... I could make the whole world know what I saw when Mrs. Eddy looked at those children. It was a revelation to me. I saw for the first time the real mother love, and I knew that I did not have it. As I turned in the procession and walked toward the line of trees in the front of the yard, there was a bird sitting on the limb of the tree, and I saw the same love poured out on that bird that I had seen flow from Mrs. Eddy to my children. I looked down at the grass and the flowers, and there was the same love resting on them. It is difficult for me to put into words what I saw. This love was everywhere, like the light, but it was divine, not mere human affection. I looked at the people milling around on the lawn, and I saw that it poured out on them. I thought of the various discords in this field, and I saw for the first time the absolute unreality of everything but this infinite love. It was not only everywhere present, like the light, but it was an intelligent presence that spoke to me, and I found myself weeping as I walked back and forth under the trees, saying out loud, why did I never know you before? Why have I not known you always? On the carriage ride back to the hotel, the mother said that that same consciousness of love was everywhere. It rested on everything that her thought rested upon. When they got back to the hotel, there was no boil on the child's head. I think about that healing often. What did Mary Baker Eddy see when she looked into the face of that child? And what was it that she discerned in the thought of the mother? And how was the mother's thought changed? And could you and I see that intelligent presence of love everywhere? And if we did, how would it change us? How would it change us as parents and teachers, as advocates for children all over the world? Well, as I've thought about those questions, a few guidelines have come to me just some basic rules that have helped me to pray for my own children, but also to pray more consistently and deeply for the world's children. And I want to share a few of those guidelines with you. Actually, we've already talked about one of them, and it is to recognize one infinite Father, Mother, God. Remember, our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. When we are willing 
to see that one infinite Father, Mother, God loving, supporting, protecting, healing each one of his children. That becomes the basis for our prayer. And we begin to see that each child has an eternal relationship with that Father, Mother, God, a relationship that is not capable of separation. And when we see that, we are obedient to the second guideline, and that is honor their completeness. Refuse to think of them in terms of lack. You know, it's so tempting to think of our little folks as kind of walking along a timeline and gaining their sense of identity, gaining their relationship with God as they go. But the truth is they are immortal ideas. They are always connected to God, and therefore they are always whole and complete. When we were in the process of adopting our first child, we went through a period of waiting while all of his papers cleared immigration and naturalization services. It took about three months. During that time, we only had two little tiny pictures of him and about three paragraphs, a brief description of his history. When we got those pictures, we were just overwhelmed with love for him. We had been praying for him already. We had been recognizing his eternal relationship to God. We had been recognizing all of the lovely qualities of God that he reflected. But now he had a face and a name. And we were just so excited about our prayers for him every single day. As we prayed, there was one definition that comes from the glossary at the back of Science and Health that was particularly helpful to us. And it was the definition of children. And it starts out this way. The spiritual thoughts and representatives of life, truth, and love. Now, in that definition, those words life and truth and love are capitalized because they are other names that we use for God. So we started with that, that this child was the spiritual thought and representative of life, truth, and love. And he had always represented life and truth and love. Later on in the definition, there was another part that really spoke to my heart. It said, not in embryo, but in maturity. Wow, what a concept. Not in embryo, but in maturity. I could look at these pictures of this little tiny boy sitting up in his high chair, and I could see all the fullness of God's might and intelligence and love already fully developed because he was not in embryo, but in maturity. And there was another thing that helped us so much. And this is on page 475 in Science and Health. And this one is the answer to the question, what is man? Now, my husband and I would take that question every day. And instead of saying, what is man? We would say, what is Jamie? And then we'd pluck his little name right into every bit of that answer. This was my favorite part of the answer. It said, he is the compound idea of God, including all right ideas. Now, that's so important. I want to just repeat it. He is the compound idea of God, including all right ideas. Now, that isn't just true for Jamie. That's true for all children, no matter what age. It's true for you and me. We include all right ideas. And you know, we saw that. We saw that when Jamie arrived. We saw a sense of, of maturity and wholeness and completeness and wisdom that never ceased to surprise us and to delight us. It was a wonderful thing to witness. But you know, sometimes we prayed and we prayed and we prayed, and then we're going along on a pretty even keel and we forget what we prayed about. Sometimes we begin to think that good is in people and things and circumstances. And if we do, we think it's out there somewhere and that we have to get it for our children. That happened to me when Jamie was about three years old. 
At that time, we were living in a second floor condominium. We had no yard. If he wanted outside, he had to play in the parking lot. We had no yard. There were no children in our condominium, so there were no little playmates. We had been trying to adopt a second child, but everywhere we looked, there was a brick wall. There was just one obstruction right after another to having a second child. We had found a lovely, just right preschool for him, but we couldn't begin to afford the tuition. So I was feeling like a great big failure as a parent. And I felt sadder and sadder about this until one day I thought, hmm, I could pray about this. So as I began to pray, one day an inspiration came to me that was so pure and clear that it was as if God was shouting at me. And this is what I heard. Don't you dare. And I went, ooh, <laughs> don't you dare what? <laughs> and it came again, so pure and clear. Don't you dare think of this child in terms of lack. I realized at that moment that I had been breaking one of the Ten Commandments. I was bearing false witness against my neighbor because I was thinking of him as this little empty vessel that I had to fill. I went back to the prayers that we had done before he arrived. I remembered that answer to the question, what is man? He is the compound idea of God, including all right ideas. And I began to realize that he included a right sense of, of home, of school, of family. He included every right idea. And so instead of feeling sorry for him, I began to be grateful for all of the good that I knew he already included. And the walls began to tumble down. Right away, two little girls moved into our building. After that, we were able to pay the tuition for his preschool in a way that I never could have imagined. After that, the weather began to get warm. And I realized that although we didn't have a yard, we had quite a wonderful pool area. And since there were mostly adults in our neighborhood, we had that pool area all to ourselves, so we invited little friends over every day to come and swim with us. We had a wonderful time. But best of all, all of the obstructions to our second adoption just dissolved. And in a matter of months, his little sister was in our house. Only God could have done that. You see, just as we had prayed before, Spirit God gathers unformed thoughts into their proper channels and unfolds these thoughts even as he opens the petals of a holy purpose in order that the purpose may appear. And God is drawing together your family in just the right way. There is no sense of a disconnected, un unconnected, unrelated idea. Every idea of God has its perfect relationship. Christ Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. If you think of a family as those who are drawn together in the name, in the nature of Christ, the Christ is then in our midst healing and redeeming and uniting us. And that is a very good thing for us to know when things get rocky in our families. And to tell the truth, sometimes they do get a little rocky. And now I'm going to tell you about one of those rocky times for me. And this is our next guideline. This one is, don't fight stubborn will with more stubborn will. <laughs> it was my daughter Katie who taught me this. Katie was such a beautiful little baby that people stopped me in the street daily. People would stop me and they would want to ooh and ah over this little child. And they would often end their, their ooing and aahing with, oh, you have a beautiful little china doll. And I would think, 
Mm-hmm. But underneath, she's a Rambo. <laughs> Katie was just so dear and so happy, so long as she got exactly what she wanted. But if she didn't, she could make my life miserable. And I just knew I did not want to spend my life butting heads with my daughter. So I began to spend time each day praying not to change Katie, but to make me a better parent. Now, there's another poem by Mary Baker Eddy that many of you may know that begins, Shepherd, show me how to go o'er the hillside steep. And I would pray with that one every day, and I would say, Shepherd, show me how to be a better parent. Show me how to go up higher in my concept of both of my children, even if it's a steep climb, even if it takes a lot from me. I want to go up higher in my sense of who they actually are. And the shepherd did show me how to go, and the shepherd showed me how to grow when Katie was ready for preschool. At that time, her outfit of choice was a pair of little black lycra bike pants and a T-shirt. And that was all that child would wear. I had a closet full of little smock dresses and cute little outfits and everything. But Katie went to school, to church, to play. She even tried to go to a wedding in black bike pants. For her first birthday party, I look back on this and I think this was a little manipulative. But we, we gave a little tea party. You know how they were doing those little girl fancy tea parties? And so her fourth birthday party, we did a fancy tea party. And all the little girls came in little dresses and hats and gloves, except for Katie, who wore black bike pants and pearls. You know, I could just, I knew that we had to go deeper in our thought about her. And so I began to every day, just quietly and humbly ask her father, mother, God, and my father, mother, God, what do you know about this little girl? And one day, a very clear answer came to me, and it was this. She was not born of the will of the flesh. So she was not programmed to act out the will of the flesh. She was born of God. And it was her joy. It was the most normal and natural thing in all the world for her to do God's will, not mine. The next time we stood in the closet having our usual debate, I think it was a Sunday before church, I didn't argue. I just prayed. I was standing there praying to know this is not a willful little mortal. She's not a willful little mortal. And suddenly... The shepherd spoke to me. And the shepherd said, And you are not a willful big mortal. I was completely humbled at that moment. The next verse of that poem came into my thought, and that next verse begins, Thou wilt bind the stubborn will. That thou refers to the shepherd. And I could see that it was the shepherd's job to bind the stubborn will, not mine. I knew that I could no longer fight stubborn will with more stubborn will. Now, did Katie stop wearing black bike pants at that moment? Nope. <laughs> But she did start being open to some other options. But as for me, when I stopped exerting my willpower, I began to see the logic of black bike pants for a little budding gymnast who actually spent more time upside down than right side up. Now, eventually, she grew out of the bike pants. <laughs> and the interesting thing to me is that she has the most amazing sense of fashion of anybody I know, and today she's the person who gives me the fashion tips. But our shepherd is still guiding us both. Let's remember that. Don't fight human will 
with more human will. Let the shepherd bind the stubborn will. And how does the shepherd bind the stubborn will? With steadfast love, with the love that never changes. And when we know that, we become humble. We become receptive. And that takes me to the next point. Be willing to learn from children. You know, they have so much to teach us if we will just step away from the teacher role and allow ourselves to be taught. It was Jamie who taught me about that when he was about eight years old. He taught me how to lift my prayer up higher. We had gone out to dinner one night with some friends, and as we sat in their dining room, Jamie, who usually ate like a horse, suddenly stopped eating. He was looking kind of pale and listless, and he said, Mom, could I go in the living room and just lie down? So I told him that was fine, gave him a few minutes, and went in to check on him. And when I did, it became clear to me that the boy had quite a high fever, and he was having chills. So we said our goodbyes to our host and hostess and headed home with Jamie. We had wrapped him up. We were singing hymns, and we were praying for him. Now, I want to say here, that we had every expectation that he would have a quick and complete healing. And that's because we had always turned to God for healing ever since the children were adopted. And each time we had had a very quick and decisive healing. So it was, it was only right for us to expect a healing this time. I got him settled in his bed and snuggled down. And I will tell you that at that time in his little Sunday school class, they had been learning about finding the spiritual counterfact of whatever their material senses were reporting to him. So I asked Jamie, you know, what is it that, that is knocking on your door right now? What is it that is seeming to overwhelm you? And he said, oh, Mom, I am so hot, and then I'm just so cold. Well, I asked him, now, sweetie, be quiet for a minute. And let's think about the spiritual counterfact of that. Now, I was a step ahead of him. I'm embarrassed to tell you this. I was thinking ahead of him, and I was thinking about the three bears. Like, not too hot, not too cold, just right. But Jamie was leagues ahead of me. He paused for a minute, and then he said to me, I'm not in matter to be hot or cold. It took my breath away. It was so pure. It was so clear that I knew he'd just heard it straight from God and that it was enough. It was enough to heal him. So I asked him to quietly consider that fact that he was not in matter to be hot or cold. And I went into my bedroom and I prayed with that for just about 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, I went in to check on him. He was fast asleep, cool as a cucumber. He slept through the night. And the next time when I woke him up in the morning, there wasn't even a trace of disease. He got up, went to Sunday school, got in trouble with his little buddies as he always did. But it was such a humbling thing for me because God had spoken to him directly. God did not require me to be a medium or an interpreter to take the truth to him. He already included that truth. I always think about that healing with one line that's in Science and Health that says, the intercommunication is always from God to his idea, man. Not from God to big man to little man, but just straight and pure. From God to his idea, man. And we can trust that intercommunication from God to his idea, man, so that we see our children, as we said, not in embryo, but in maturity. And that allows us to be obedient to the next guideline, which is take them off the timeline. Refuse to see states and stages. Christ Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. 
he was so aware of his eternal relationship to God that all the constraints of time had no hold on him. We can't imagine a toddler Jesus throwing a tantrum. We can't imagine a teenage Jesus being sullen and rebellious. When he was 12, he went to the temple and he reasoned with the priest and the rabbis. Did they have to talk down to him? No. Now this reminds me of something that Mary Baker Eddy says. She says, man in science is neither young nor old. He has neither birth nor death. If we have neither birth nor death, then we don't have states and stages marking the way between birth and death. But what do we have instead? We have wholeness. We have completeness. We have immortality. Do we think of our children in that light, in the light of immortality? Do we think of ourselves in that light. Often we don't. We can do a better job. When Jamie was a freshman in high school, we moved from our home in Atlanta up to Boston. And it was quite a tough adjustment for all of us, but it was particularly tough for Jamie. And we went through a really trying time with this boy. He had always been a really good student. He was a bright guy, but now it was as if he was trying to, to fail in school. You remember I told you about how I got that clear message, don't you dare think of him in terms of lack. But I forgot. I started thinking of him in terms of lack, and I thought I saw a lack of motivation, a lack of joy, a lack of, of focus and purpose. And most of all, I thought I saw just this stunning lack of love, especially for his parents and his family. So I was praying about it a lot, but it seemed that we were going from bad to worse. One night, I went to the high school. This was a high school that put a great deal of emphasis on everybody going to a four-year college. And starting even in freshman year, you began to have a lot of pressure about where they were going to go to college and how they were going to get there. And that night, the whole room was around every wall, posters of various colleges in, in the Boston community and what it would take to get into those colleges. Grade point, SAT scores, essays, extracurricular activities, references from teachers. And I looked around that room, and I was so overwhelmed, and I thought, we are in trouble. And we were. And between, after that, Within days, his Spanish teacher called me, and she said, I can't believe what Jamie did. She said, he was eking by in his Spanish class, but when it was time for the final exam, he walked up to my desk, and he ripped up his exam very dramatically and threw it in the trash and stalked out. She said, I have to fail him in Spanish. Well, knowing what I just read about all the requirements, I knew we were in trouble. I was angry. I was frustrated, and I was a lot afraid. What was going to happen to my boy if he didn't wake up? So I called a Christian science practitioner to help me pray about it. Now, in case you've not heard about what a Christian science practitioner is, this is someone who gives his or her full time to healing prayer. And anyone of any denomination can call a Christian science practitioner for help. And we will pray with you and help you to find spiritual solutions to your prayers. So I called a friend who was a practitioner, and I poured out my sad, sad story about my boy. And she paused a minute, and then she said, Julie, do you know what, this, what your problem is? And I said, no. And she said, you see this boy going down a timeline, and you think it looks like this. If he does well in high school, he'll get into a good college. And if he go, does well in college, he'll get into a good grad school. And if he does well in grad school, he'll have a nice career. And out there somewhere, he will earn a nice home and family. Well, you know what? That was exactly what I thought. But I saw the error of that. And my friend, the practitioner, said to me, take him off the timeline. He already includes his education. 
He already includes his career. He already includes his family now. And in that moment, I could see that there were no contingencies for Jamie. That God's plan for him included no contingencies, no detours, no failures. He could not undo what God had already done. He could not sabotage his own complete and holy spiritual identity. And knowing that, I started to pray more and worry less. I stopped trying to convince him to be the wonderful boy I knew he was. And I just yielded to the fact that he was that, that wonderful, whole, complete idea of God. And a wonderful thing happened. Although he did fail Spanish, although he continued to have less than spectacular grades, he was accepted into a wonderful college. And he had an amazing experience there. And it was so clear to us that God was putting him right where he needed to be to fulfill his holy purpose. Once again, we went back to that wonderful line we had prayed with before we even met him. Spirit, God gathers unformed thoughts into their proper channels and unfolds these thoughts even as he opens the petals of a holy purpose in order that the purpose may appear. And this is true for every child everywhere. Each one has his or her holy purpose, and it is a purpose that cannot be thwarted or hidden or derailed. And that purpose rests in God. And so it's safe. It's not going anywhere. That purpose is immortal. That's the purpose that can't be lost. That takes me to the very last point. Fear not. They can't get outside of God. In this age of helicopter parents, it, it seems as if we kind of equate love for our children with fear for our children. And that seems pretty justified because the world seems like a much more dangerous place today than it was when you and I were growing up. So we have a choice to make. Are we going to spend our time fending off one evil and then another and then another? Or are we going to yield to the omnipotence of good? When my children were little, I walked out of their room every night at bedtime with one sentence from science and health. God is everywhere, and nothing apart from him is present or has power. I felt that if they only knew that one sentence, that that would enable them to meet anything that they had to face in life. I knew that if they knew that God is everywhere, that they could never get outside of God's love. They couldn't run away from it. They couldn't be taken away from it. And I knew that if they knew that love was the only power, that it could not be opposed, they could never find an enemy. They could never find a place of danger or vulnerability. God is everywhere. And nothing apart from him is present or has power. And there are no danger zones in the presence of God. I learned that when Jamie was deployed to Afghanistan during his military service. Sometimes during that time, I would wake up in the middle of the night just frozen with fear for him. And sometimes I'd be driving the car and I'd have to pull the car over so I could cry for a while. But then I would remember what we had agreed before he left. Our family made an agreement that when any one of us was afraid, we would meet in the 91st Psalm. And by that we meant that we would turn to the 91st Psalm and we would actively claim all of the promises in that Psalm, not just for Jamie, 
but for all, no matter what side they were on, but that all of God's children were dwelling in the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty. I want to read to you part of that, po part of that psalm as Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in his book, The Message. This is verses 3 to 5. He rescues you from hidden traps, shields you from deadly hazards. His huge outstretched arm protects you. Under them, you're perfectly safe. His arms fend off all harm. Fear nothing, not wild wolves in the night, nor flying arrows in the day, not disease that prowls through the darkness, nor disaster that erupts at high noon. Fear nothing. Their Father, Mother, God, all harmonious, is with them, guarding them, guiding them, protecting them. And that Father, Mother, God, all harmonious, is all-knowing, all-seeing, knows their specific identity and their specific needs. Now, I want to share with you one more thing. And this is a poem that was originally published in the Christian Science Journal. It's by Holly Suey, and it's called Only a Lamb. In a dream that seemed so real, I heard my child calling to me to save him. Frantic, and with all my strength, I rushed to the scene, finding him already beyond my reach. My heart cried out to my God and his. It was then I woke to hear Christ speak. God, love, is like a shepherd who carries his lambs in his arms all the day long and all the night long, who never puts one down and never lets one down. My dear lamb, God said to me, I have never asked you to be the shepherd. Both lambs were saved. We have never been asked to be the shepherd. We have been asked to be tender, patient, obedient lambs. Lambs who completely trust their shepherd and consistently follow their shepherd. Can we do this? Yes, we can. Now, I want to just take one little moment to go back through our guidelines so that you have a little favor to take home with you. And I hope when you get home, you will open it up and use these guidelines in your prayers for the children of the world. Think what would happen if everybody in this room took five minutes a day to pray for the children of the world. So the great overarching headline that we have, our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. That's so important that I want us all to say it together. Ready? Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. Now, as we see that, we automatically have become obedient to the first guideline. Recognize one infinite Father, Mother, God. The acknowledgement of that one infinite Father, Mother, God will take us to the second, which is honor their completeness. Refuse to think of them in terms of lack. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And when you honor their completeness, you won't see them as little personal identities that we have to make in our own image and likeness. They're already God's image and likeness. And if we see that, then we won't fight stubborn will with more stubborn will. Remember the little black bike pants. Honoring their completeness will make us humble. We will stand on even ground with our children. 
And as we are humble, then we are obedient to the next guideline, which would be be willing to learn from children. When we're willing to learn from children, we know the inner communication is always from God to his idea, man. And then we take them off the timeline. We refuse to see states and stages. And when we've done all of that, then inevitably we get to the last guideline. Who remembers what it is? Fear not. They can't get outside of God. We're not afraid for them. We're not afraid for them because we know they cannot get outside of the presence, that intelligent presence of love that we spoke about before. And you know what? You can't get outside of that intelligent presence of love either. Remember that you too are God's tender, precious lambs. So let God guide you and feed you and protect you and love you. And then both lambs are saved. Thank you so much. Go home and pray for the children. <laughs>